chapter 2. Four verses. I want us to see the importance of this day, this day of Pentecost, as these disciples, these apostles are gathered in that upper room and they are waiting for the Holy Spirit to move in their life. Today, I think, is an extremely important sermon. Please listen. It's going to be a teaching sermon. It's going to be something that you're going to a lot of knowledge is going to be thrown at you. Please stay with me. Focus on uh, the Word of God, and let's kind of stick with this and try to stay in it and understand what's being said here. The symbolism, there's a lot of symbolism in what was going on, and so please hang in there. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying, and tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask right now that your Holy Spirit move among us, in us, and through us, and to us. Anoint me for a task that I'm not capable of, preaching your word. Speak to our hearts. Help us to hear your word in each of our languages today that we understand. Lord, take the distractions away for a moment that we can hear from heaven. Speak. Last week, we addressed the issue of Judas's suicide and the choosing of Matthias, Matthias to replace Judas. They wanted to make sure, these disciples, these apostles, wanted to make sure that when the day of Pentecost came or the day that the Holy Spirit came upon them, that they had 12 of them there. So Peter stands up and he decides that they're going to make sure that one is added to their ranks the lot fell to Matthias to replace Judas, that great betrayer. Luke, if you can take my mic and turn it down a little bit here. Verses 1 through 4 speak of a violent rushing wind from heaven. Now, verse 1 addresses that which was scriptural and most essential. Let's read verse 1 again. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Now, notice that they're unified. They're all together in one place. But this word, Pentecost, it actually means 50th. It refers to the Feast of Weeks or Harvest, which was celebrated 50 days after Pentecost in May or June. Now, the day of Pentecost had come 1,500 times before. Now it was fully come. It had come and gone ever since Moses instituted this feast. Now it had come to stay. Now on the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament times, the Jews took individual grains of corn, they ground them into flour, and then they added oil and leaven and made two loaves of bread. The loaves were then offered to the Lord along with the sacrifice of seven lambs without blemish, one young bullock, and two rams for a burnt offering, ten sacrifices in all to symbolize, and of course this, symboli this symbolized the perfection and the completeness of Calvary. And this had been done, as I said, 1,500 times. And I don't think the people as they were doing that completely understood, but eventually it would show forth Calvary, the perfection of the completeness of Calvary. Now, all symbolized what took place 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. Pentecost always fell on the first day of the week, symbolizing even in Old Testament typology the end of the Sabbath and the consecration of a new day for a new dispensation. Now, all this was highly significant. The oil typified the work of the Holy Spirit on the day of 
Pentecost. For instance, the inclusion of leaven in the loaves was unusual for the Jewish people, for leaven was rigorously excluded from other meal offerings because it is or it represented a type of sin. Now, the ordinary meal offering symbolized Christ because there was no leaven. It was showing perfection, and it showed that he was wholly free from sin. Leaven was included in the loaves of Pentecost, however, because those loaves typified the church, and the church has never been free from sin as the church is the people of God, and they have never been free of sin. The burnt offering aspect of Calvary was accompanied by the sacrifice of one kid of the goat for a sin offering and two yearling lambs for a peace offering that symbolized the ground upon which the believer has perfect peace with God. Now at the first or the feast of first fruits, individual stalks of grain loosely bound together were used to symbolize the resurrection of Christ and his own and his triumph over death. On the day of Pentecost, those individual stalks and grains were replaced by a loaf of bread, one homogenous body to symbolize what would happen when the day of Pentecost would be fully come. On that day, 120 individual believers loosely bound together by the bonds of Christ ascended the stairs to that upper room with one accord. One body of believers came down. Individuals went up. A church came down. The mystical body of Christ, one mystical body. The fact that two loaves were used in the Old Testament rituals equally significant. There was to be a second Pentecost, so to speak, some years later in the house of Cornelius, which would bring Gentiles into the body on an equal basis as that of the Jews. And thereafter, in God's sight, there would be neither Jew nor Gentile. So far as the church was concerned, there would be just one body. Thus, that which was scriptural and most essential was about to take place the unique coming of the Holy Spirit as promised by Jesus, as predicted in the Scripture, along with that which was scriptural and most essential we have in verses 2 and 3, we have that which was dramatic and temporary. It was dramatic, but it was also temporary. Verse 2 speaks to the mighty sound of the wind. Let's look at that verse again. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house. They were staying where they were staying. It was not wind, but it was the sound, sound like wind, something resembling a rushing tornado. The sound was not of earth, but it was of heaven. It was symbolic. It announced the presence of the Holy Spirit. The wind is another of those divinely chosen biblical symbols of the Spirit of God. He comes from heaven. He fills the earth. He moves at his own will. He cannot be cornered. He cannot be contained by any special interest group. His comings and his goings are according to his fixed laws, but he is sovereignly limited by none. He can be commanded by no one. He is at the service of man but he will do what he wants to do, not what we want. And he is omnipresent and omnipotent. He is everywhere. He is all-powerful. All that is perfectly symbolized by the sound from heaven like a violent rushing wind. In speaking to Nicodemus of the new, of the new birth, Jesus said, the wind blows where it pleases and you hear it sound but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This aspect of Pentecost was temporary. It came and it went to never return. It was a once-for-all phenomenon. It was something they heard, and it arrested their attention as it filled this upper room. Nothing was heard of the wind outside. It caught only the ears of those in the upper room. The age about to begin was to indeed catch the ear of all. It was to be an age of faith, faith that comes from what is heard, as Romans 10, 17 says. Also, they heard the sound, but there was no other sensation there. 
They heard this wind, but they did not feel this wind. There was no emphasis on feeling at all, for it is faith, not feeling, that is the hallmark of this age. I want us to take note of that, because I think sometimes in this day and age, we take any talk of the Holy Spirit and we immediately want to throw it into feeling. There was no feeling here whatsoever. They heard this wind, and it represented the Holy Spirit. We must be careful to pull feelings too much into things. Now, I have been in situations in churches where we just completely cast out feeling altogether, and I don't believe you want to do that. But at the same time, feelings can confuse us. Emotions can get us all confused and off task. It is God's word. God speaks through his word in concrete terms. And so to just dance around with feelings, I don't think that's what God wants in our lives. I think he wants us to be about his word and to be grounded. Uh, but we do have feelings. You have feelings of joy when you're grounded in God's word. Verse 3 speaks to the remarkable sight of fire. Verse 3, and tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now first came the sound and then the sight. That was God's order. I think many times we want to reverse that order. We would like to see first, but God puts the hearing first. The fire was another symbol of the Spirit. Fire begins with a small flame, but it spreads. It can devour, devour a forest or consume a city. It burns. There is a judgment element associated with fire. The lost will spend eternity in a lake of fire. It purges. It illuminates. It warms. It smolders. Men may resist and even quench ordinary fire, but the Holy Spirit's fire they can never, ever put out. It will burn on quietly in the heart of a believer, and it will begin to spread again. All of this and more is suggested by the fire at Pentecost, a fitting symbol of both the Holy Spirit and the church age that was upon them. But it was not literal fire, for there was nothing to feel, again, feelings, nothing to feel, nor was, nor was this sign repeated, nor did the outside world see it. And tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each of them. Now this was the baptism of the Spirit, and they all partook of this, this mysterious baptism in symbolic flame, embraced them all equally. Peter did not get a special baptism. The humblest, unknown, unnamed believer in this company had just as much of a baptism of the Spirit, a, an anointing, and a filling as the foremost of the disciples. God is no respecter of persons. This baptism was not a special work of grace given to some and not to others. The divided tongue sat upon each one individually, equally, and indiscriminately. Did you see that? It sat upon each of them. It wasn't one special person, Peter or somebody else or John. Each of these 120 that were in that upper room, it sat upon each of them equally. The phenomena of the upper room was spectacular, but it was passing. It came, it went, and it never, ever came again. We have then symbolic wind, symbolic fire to usher in a new age and change in dispensation. The fact that the day of Pentecost had arrived heralded the death of the old Jewish ritual, uh, Pentecost, and the birth of the church age of God. Verse 4 speaks to that which was spiritual and apparent. The first part of verse 4 addresses an infilling presence. Let's read that verse, verse 4, the first part. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Seven ministries of the Holy Spirit affect the believer in this age, including the baptism, the gift, the indwelling, the seal, and the earnest. Those are all sovereign acts of God that are bestowed on the believer at their time of their salvation. They are unconditional. They are sovereignly under God's control and impartially administered to every believer in the Lord Jesus 
They never need to be repeated. They are never withdrawn, and they guarantee the believer's eternal security and his glorious standing in Christ. Being filled with the Spirit, though, is different. It is conditional, Paul says in Ephesians 5.18. He uses the present continuous tense, and he says literally, but be filled by the Spirit. And he uses as an illustration being filled with wine as a fluctuating state. Paul says, don't be drunk on wine that leads to debauchery. It leads to sin and unrighteousness. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Clarity coming from God. You think about a drunk, your mind and your eyes, they're all, they're, they're blurred, your vision's blurred, that sort of thing. He says, don't be like that. Be clear-minded by the power of the Holy Spirit. Basically, take God's Word and let it live out in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. The filling is temperamental in so much as it is largely, it largely depends on the individual believer. He can be filled one moment and because of some disobedience, empty the next. The purpose of the filling is to change our temperament and make us like Jesus in his nature, in his person, in his personality, so that in our thought, in our word, in our deed, we might display Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. The filling is always available to us, but our realization of it depends upon our cooperation with the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, all of those who were filled with the Spirit, the filling is available to every believer. There is no exception, and there can be no excuse for not being filled. That's the scary thing for us, I believe. I think often we're not filled with the Spirit. Of course, when you're saved, the Holy Spirit's placed in your life. The Holy Spirit does not leave a believer's life. That never will happen but being filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, living a life that's holy and set apart, not living like the world, and being filled with the Holy Spirit, taking God's word and let it so infuse your life, control and transform your life. That's being filled by the Holy Spirit, actually taking God's word and obeying it, acting like Christ Jesus, who set the example for us of how to live. Of course, he lived a perfect life. None of us can live a perfect life. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a lifestyle. And yesterday, there was a funeral. And in that funeral, I talked heavily about that. Being born again. Most of this country says, oh, I'm born again. 80% of America says, I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. Billy Graham, and I mention his name because everybody knows who he is. That's the only reason I mention it. Billy Graham made the statement that of the church, we're not talking about people who don't want to show up to church. We're talking about people in church. He said 80 to 90 percent of them are lost, even those who sit on the pews. That ought to scare us to death. And I hope yesterday it did scare some to death. That was the point. But I think I would go further than that. So many are lost. They never were born again. When you are born again, God transforms your life. He changes you. He places the good works in you. He does the work. And if that hasn't happened in your life, then you're not saved. You are lost and you're on your way to hell. Being filled with the Spirit is another. It shows us that you're born again that your life is transformed, that you are a new creature. Paul the Apostle said you must be a new creature. Now the remaining operation of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is the anointing for service. And in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings, they were anointed for their respective ministries. Not all men were anointed for the same task. The Lord Jesus was always filled with the Spirit, but he was anointed. He was not anointed until he began his ministry, and you can see that in Matthew 3, 16, and Luke 4, 16 and 19, or 16 through 19. Now, the usual word for anointing in the New Testament is unction, and it's related to the believer's special ability to use the word of God with power, to be anointed, to take God's word and actually be able to do it, to live by it, to honor God 
with it, the anointing. Now, the second part of verse 4 speaks of an outflowing of power. So we see that there is an infilling of power by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's coming into your life, but there's also this outflowing, another proof of salvation in a, in a man or a woman's life. Look at verse or the second part of verse 4. And began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. I love the whole and the way it translates it correctly. Different languages. Now, the gift of different languages in the early church was evidential in character. Its purpose was to attest to the Jewish people the, imp- the simple but solemn fact that Judaism was now obsolete and that Christianity had t- taken its place. The importance of a language is related to the fact that for 2,000 years, if God had anything to say, he said it in the Hebrew tongue. But from now on, it was going, he was going to reveal himself in the Greek For 2,000 years, too, the Jews were a specially chosen, privileged people. From now on, God was going to bring Gentiles into the place of religious privilege and would reach out to every kindred, every people, every language. Different languages were, therefore, an evidential gift, a sign to the Jews, the nation that had been the depository of divine truth for centuries and that had now crowned all of its other apostasy with the crime of Calvary. They had just murdered their Christ, their Messiah. Having rejected the Savior, the Jews were to be given another chance to receive the Spirit. That also being rejected, they could expect nothing but judgment. The book of Acts is the record, among other things, of the way in which the Jews, first of the homeland and then those of the Uh, uh, dispersion, those that were dispersed out, turned in fury toward the gospel. Languages were intended to be a judgment sign upon the Jewish nation. Paul makes that clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 21 through 22, where he quotes from the book of Isaiah 28, verses 11 and 12. Paul says, it is written in the law, I will speak to these people by people of other languages and by the lips of foreigners, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. It follows that speaking in other languages is intended as a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Languages are mentioned on only three occasions in the book of Acts, and nowhere else in the New Testament except in 1 Corinthians, where Paul has to deal with its flagrant abuse. Wherever languages are mentioned, Jews are present, And unbelieving Jews are in the background. Not all people had the gift of different languages. It was strictly a temporary and transitional gift. Moreover, Paul said it would come to an automatic end. In verse 8 of that love chapter, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. This temporary sign gift seems to have terminated with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., the judgment of which it was a warning sign. That's what the languages for were to warn those Jews. It was the least important of all the gifts. It was abused, and it had to be put under severe restraint. No manifestation of different languages could exceed three occurrences at any one service, and a valid interpreter must be present. A test was later added to guard against satanic deception according to 1 John 4, 1 through 3. And I want to read those verses to you. It says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out, prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit who does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. You have heard that he is coming, and he is already in the world. You see there the point, the dangers that can come when we take different languages and we apply it to gibberish. You can't do that. It was different languages that they were speaking in. And John and Paul had to warn 
to warn the people, be careful what you're listening to. Because Peter, when he stood up and when they were speaking in these languages, what were they talking about? They were talking about Jesus Christ who had come, died on a cross, was resurrected, ascended into heaven, was king of kings and lord of lords, that you must repent of your sin. That's what it was about. That's the message. There's no other message. Remember that. That's our message. That's what it's all about. God sent his son to this earth who lived a sinless life because you and I can't live that sinless life. The Bible says he became the propitiation for us. And that's where he took the wrath of God upon himself. He went to a cross. He was nailed to that cross. All the pain and agony that went around that, he took the wrath for you and I. He was the propitiation. The Bible says he died. He literally died. He wasn't in a coma. He was buried. And on the third day, he was resurrected. And recently, we talked about him walking this earth for 40 days, giving many convincing proofs that he was alive to over 500 people he appeared. Then he ascended into heaven. Paul the apostle saw him in heaven. Jesus said, along with Paul and all the others. You must repent of your sin. Earlier I was talking about being born again. And I'm worried that we don't understand what that means in this day of grace. I love the word grace, and I love all that it means. Every bit of salvation is of God. God has to do the work. Even placing the faith in your life to believe on him, which you're called to believe, and then the faith and the works and all of those things are done by God. That's what his word teaches. If you study it from beginning to end, his grace, he saves us in spite of us, what we deserve. We all deserve to go to hell. We're all sinners, but he saves us anyway. But I think sometimes we take that grace, and like Paul warned us, and we talked a lot about that when we were going through the book of Romans, don't use that as a license for sin to think, well, I can just live any way I want. And I believe that if you live a lifestyle of sin, I'm not saying because we sin, we all sin. I'm the chief among sinners right here standing before you. But I'm saying if you live a lifestyle of sin and it doesn't bother you at all, and you can just do that, then maybe you're not born again. Maybe you're not truly a Christian. You're not on your way to heaven. That's a terrible thought. Jesus taught double on hell what he taught on heaven. So if anything exists, hell exists. And those that have rejected his son, those that have not been truly born again, will go to hell. And they will burn there for eternity. Never, ever will you come out. That's a terrible thought. But if you believe upon Christ, Romans says, if you confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, understand confess. That's the problem with the English language. We think of confess. We say, okay, well, I'll say it with you, Paul. Jesus is Lord. And then we walk out of here and live any way we want. He's not Lord of our life. We're just confessing it the way we do here. We just say it. That's not confession of the Scriptures. Confession of the Scriptures means it gets from this mind, okay, Jesus is my Lord, to my heart, and it transforms my life. I'm never the same person. I don't act the same way. That's true confession. Believing, true belief is not just believing in your mind. Man, most, most of this country, you could walk up and they could probably give you the gospel. I'm talking about the drunk out of the bar. He could tell me the gospel. That's scary. That's not about doing it. It's got to go from here to there. It's got to transform your life. You must be born again. And yesterday in that funeral, I tried so hard to get that message across. I don't think that it got across very well. As I mentioned, 80% of this country is Christian. Then why are our churches empty? Why is abortion, which, which Hitler would have loved? I mean, abortion was exactly what he was trying to do. We've accomplished what Hitler was trying to do. Just kill anybody that you don't want. And we've done it in such a clean way in this country. We're worse than Hitler today. Or at least America is. 
why is, is this country the worst in the world in crime? If we're 80% Christian, there shouldn't be any crime at all. So I don't know if the message got across. I'm going to pray that it did. I'm going to pray that people's lives truly are transformed. But to walk out of here after a message like yesterday and after a message like this and to just think, well, I hope I'm a Christian, that is foolishness. I said this yesterday. If you were going to drive on a trip, if you were going to take a trip, you would at least, anybody with any brains would walk around, and of course I've messed this up before, but anyway, hopefully, with any brains, you would walk around your car and at least look at your tires and make sure they're, they look like they're inflated correctly. It, it, even smarter to go up to Agland and, and check them out, go around and make sure they're filled up. You would check your oil, at least, at least check it, maybe change it. Make sure there's gas in the car. My, my point in all of that is, the Bible says make sure of your salvation. Don't just dumbly and foolishly think, oh, everything's okay, I'm fine. I, I, I made a profession, I, I was baptized, I took a communion, I did this or I did that, and so I've got to be a Christian. It doesn't work that way. Make sure of your salvation. I pray today that everyone has done that. And if you are saved, that you're filled with the Spirit, that you're living out God's Word, you're honoring God and all that you say, do, and think. I'm exhorting you today that this be your life. God's Word. People that are born again, this is their life. Not other things. This is God's Word. I believe we have a song. Stand with us. The front is always.